I'm from a place that was paradise when I was growing up. And now it is slowly turning into a dystopia of unnatural disasters. I'm from California, but that sentence could have been said by someone from Greece, Australia, Honduras, Tuvalu, or any number of other beautiful places that have been scorched and parched and waterboarded by raging skies. And if that comes as a shock to people like me, to so many black, brown, and indigenous residents of frontline communities, environmental destruction has been a fact of life for decades. Their own corners of paradise poisoned by lead or particulate pollution or treeless city heat islands long before people started drowning in their basements in Queens and Brooklyn. We are told that climate change doesn't mobilize sufficient political will because all those projections and percentages are simply too abstract. But climate change has become personal for millions of people around the world. And it will be very soon very personal for everyone. This conference seeks to respond to the fact that we now have the best science in history producing a consensus about the urgency of the problem and what to do about it. But this has still not produced enough action. We need more than climate science to tackle climate silence. We need our activists, our authors, and our artists to touch the hearts of those whose minds have not yet been moved by all the data. Having seen the power of the expressive work produced by the people we will be hearing from this weekend, part of me is wistful wishing that this symposium were being held in Glasgow, where it could touch the hearts of the negotiators at COP26, the 26th the UN Conference of the Parties on Climate Change. And in fact, the State Department's US Climate Center for COP26 has put us on their virtual pavilion as one of the only exhibitors. So in a way, we are there. And we are very fortunate to have this symposium taking place right here at American University, which has long been an environmental leader from our first in the nation carbon neutral campus to our strategic focus on sustainability, our new center of the environment, community, and equity, or the hundred or more faculty working in this area so that our students who are learning more about the world that will become theirs may have the same opportunity to enjoy its life-sustaining wonder that we had when we were young. I am grateful to the wonderful lineup of speakers who have honored us by giving us their time this weekend, led by Diane Burko, whose artworks capture so compellingly the loss of life and beauty in the disappearing paradise of this earth we still might save. It was her vision that made this symposium come to pass. I'd like to thank two longtime supporters of the museum, Andrea Boyarski Mizell and Harvey Mizell, who are with us this evening, for a generous gift that made possible this symposium, as well as the AU Year of Climate Action that it launches. And I want to thank those who worked so hard to make this event a reality, especially Sarah Leary, Chelsea Anderson, Dylan Singleton, Erica Fortwangler, Haley Jardis, Rebecca Basu, and the faculty committee of Simon Nicholson, Kiho Kim, Maggie Stogner, and David Vasquez. Thanks also to Provost Peter Starr and President Sylvia Burwell for their participation and their support. Now, I'd like to introduce one of several video messages we'll hear this weekend that have been sent to us by prominent participants in COP26. Bill McKibben is founder of 350.org, the first global grassroots climate campaign. He helped launch the fossil fuel divestment movement that has moved more than $15 trillion out of oil, gas, and coal. A few of those dollars belonging to the AU endowment, thanks to our students' persistence. His 1989 book, The End of Nature, is regarded as the first book for a general audience about climate change. He has received international awards for peace and honorary degrees from some 20 universities. Let's hear now from Bill McKibben.
Hello, everybody. This is Bill McKibben, and what a pleasure to get to join you there at AU, um, where I've gotten to spend several great occasions and where I'm so grateful to the people who've worked so hard to do things like divestment. Um, this is a topic that's really, really close uh, to my heart, this question of how we see climate change, how we think about it. And I, I've been working on this a very long time. I wrote the first book about climate change way back in 1989, which means really before we had pictures to point to, examples, when we were still describing the threat that was coming. And so it was mostly with words that we could paint the picture uh, 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 of what was ahead, mostly with words, but also, of course, with, with science, with the, um, the predictions, the graphs, the charts. Um, it's been very important over the last 30 years to keep figuring out new ways to help people locate this greatest of all crises humans have ever wandered into, but also one that's sporadic that occurs on a time scale just a tiny bit too slow for us to easily perceive it day to day that's so large that there's uh, a, 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 a chance that we can't see either the trees or the forest because we live in them and so let me talk in particular about the importance of the arts uh, as a way of starting to get at some of these things. Um, I wrote a piece, maybe 2005 or so, saying, where is all the art about climate change? Why hasn't it, in the way that, say, the AIDS crisis did, produced extraordinary art? Um, and that was really the last year or two that I think I could have written that piece, because since the work, um, I think the reason that it took so long is because human beings are primed by their history to see most of the real drama in the world as occurring between human beings. The conflict between human beings has been most of what we've written plays about, painted pictures of, uh, 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 had novels that centered on for, for a very long time. And in that world, the natural world served mostly as backdrop, almost unchanging backdrop against which to illuminate these enormous uh, uh, events between people. It took a while for us to begin to come to terms with the fact that the backdrop is now foreground. It doesn't mean that the conflicts between people aren't there. And of course, maybe the most important thing to say about climate change is that the iron law of global warming is, the less you did to cause it, the sooner and harder you get hit. So all of our old concerns about justice are amplified to absolutely new heights by, by this great horror. Um, I think it's arguable that it's the single most damaging thing we've ever done to the poorest and most vulnerable people on the planet, which when you think about all the other things we've done, it makes it pretty remarkable. But that's why it's very good that artists are breaking through. <clears throat> Diane Burko's work in particular that I've had the opportunity to write about a little bit is, is a really remarkable example um, um, because she really is able to help us see. And that's crucially important. You know, the environmental movement has always done much better at appealing to whichever hemisphere of the brain it is that likes bar graphs and pie charts. But we need to appeal to the whole brain, um, the part that responds viscerally to the world around us. And that's why work like this is so utterly crucial. Yes, uh, people who invent a new, more efficient solar panel do an enormous job of good and they're absolutely essential. People who invent a new metaphor uh, for helping us understand this are as important right now in making the changes that we have to make. So many, many thanks to all the artists who are hard at work at this and to all the other people who are trying to figure out how this fits together.
how it helps communities, especially the frontline and most vulnerable communities, bring their work to the forefront. And I'll just end by saying, you're seeing extraordinary art come not only from established artists, but also from those communities in the process of the fight. I'm thinking, I say, of the extraordinary um, um, images that emerged from uh, the fights at Standing Rock or Line 3 in Minnesota this past summer. Um, um, they remind us of the extraordinary vitality of these traditions in helping us do this most important task of seeing and beyond seeing, feeling the world around us. Thank you all so much. An inspiring figure I, indeed. Well, now I'd like to introduce Jack Rasmussen, director and curator extraordinaire of the American University Museum at the Katz and Arts Center since it opened in 2005. Jack has uh, turned this museum into a force for positive social change uh, in so many ways, and this event is no exception. Jack, the floor is yours. Come on up. This is American University's year of climate action. It is built on the university's commitment to engage faculty, staff, and community at the intersection of scientific insight, artistic imagining, political struggle, and public searching. It is a year-long call to arms against the existential threat of climate change. It all began with an exhibition proposal from two pioneering feminist scholars, AU professors Emerita Mary Garrett and Norma Browdy. They proposed to curate an exhibition by the painter, photographer, and climate activist Diane Burko for the American University Museum. I've had the pleasure of working with Garrett and Burko and Browdy many times in the past. Their teachings inspired me and generations to resist the masculinist tendencies of modern and contemporary art. Their writings are as relevant today as they were when they were first introduced in 1970s. Their legacy at American University continues to influence artists and scholars. The involvement of Garrett and Browdy convinced me that this is the right time, that we must use this opportunity to educate to understand the broader social political implications of environmental degradation and present Burko's work on climate change as a model for art provoking action. Burko has long been a prominent and a persuasive advocate for art's role in addressing climate change. Her experience led her to insist that a symposium was needed to augment the exhibition, to make sure we moved out of the realm of objects hung on walls and into the realm of action. We agreed with Diane Burko and with Klaus Oldenburg, whose 1961 manifesto proclaimed, I am for an art that does something other than sit on its ass in the museum. So to kick off this symposium, we bring you an amazing panel. Eleanor Hartney has been an art writer and curator for over 35 years. In her numerous books and articles and in her role as contributing editor, to Art in America. She has written frequently on the social role of art and the ways that it intersects, intersects with politics, religion, gender, globalism, and the environment. She has made in-depth studies of many of the major figures in the environmental art movement and is currently contributing a study of eco-feminist art to a forthcoming book on contemporary art's debt to the pioneering feminist artists of the 1970s. Eleanor will be discussing that role, that potential of art to help change the conversation around this most urgent of issues. Eleanor, by the way, is also the curator of Anil Reverie Into the Light, currently on view now in the museum's project space on the second floor. Her catalog essay, essay for Reverie's exhibition addresses the idea of art as a tool for expanding consciousness, just as she sees Burko's exhibition working to expand climate awareness and inspire social and political action. 
Jennifer McGregor is a curator and arts planner who brings expertise in ecological art, curating programming, and public art planning to artist-centered work. For over two decades, she conceived place-based exhibitions at Wave Hill, a world-renowned public garden and cultural center in the Bronx. There, she activated connections to the environment by producing adventurous projects that explored nature, culture, and sight, including Seven Deadly Sins, Wrath, Force of Nature, that featured paintings by Diane Burko. Through McGregor Consulting, she developed strategies to engage non-traditional public spaces and diverse audiences with dynamic artists. Diane Burko is a force of nature. She is a painter, photographer, climate activist, but wait, there's more. She's long been a prominent advocate for art's role in addressing climate change, traveling to some of the most affected areas around the world, the Arctic Circle, Antarctica, the Great Barrier Reef. She has interacted and collaborated with members of the scientific community while producing a visually compelling oeuvre that powerfully communicates the threats posed by climate change. While continuing to engage the traditions of landscape painting, her increasingly abstract and large-scale images are layered with visual and scientific information about the urgent challenge posed to the planet, manifested in glacial melting, coral reef bleaching, raging forest fires, and the COVID-19 pandemic. Since 2018, Burko has embraced time-based media with melting and flowing imagery that forcefully underscores her subject of climate degradation over time. If you haven't already, reward yourself by walking across the lobby, entering the museum, and experiencing Diane's exhibition, her compelling exhibition, Prepare to be Moved. So I'm going to walk over here, and we're going to have a few question and answers between us, and then we're going to open it up uh, to the audience here and the virtual audience uh, everywhere. So let me come down. Thank you, Jack. <laughs> You're welcome, Diane. <laughs> Thank you for this show. So I have, a pan I have a question for the panel. What can art do that science can't? What artists contribute to what can artists contribute to the discussion about climate change? What are some of the ways that artists have worked with scientists on climate change? So there's three questions in one. <laughs> well, I think the curator should take those questions because <laughs> you guys have worked with so many artists. Well, I would say there, there's, there's just so many different ways. And I think Diane's work presents a particular way of working um, which involves both the exploration of actually going there, which I think is really important, and I see this with so many artists. I mean, the, the, the numbers of artists ha that have gone to Greenland and, and the Arctic and, and all over, and to really experience it themselves and to bring that experience back to us and to bring it in the way that they're seeing and experiencing it, not just through the graphs and the numbers, but through the, um, you know, their lens and also to be able to collaborate and to really talk the language of scientists and to be able to really bridge that. And I think that's, you know, it was interesting for Bill to hear Bill McKibben say there weren't any climate artists in 2005. Well, we could have another panel about that. <laughs> right. But the fact is that there, the, there's so many more artists in, in, in this period that, it, that, has, that the burning desire to explore these issues has really exploded. And also, with, within climate change and environment, you have so many different um, areas where artists are really working with scientists. And where scientists, like I've worked a lot with trying to have artists and, and architects work together, and artists and all different professions work together. And I think that somehow artists and scientists have a way of really being able to work together. I would be interested to see what you but say. We love about each that, other. <laughs> I, I always like to say it's like a, um, a symbiotic relationship. Yeah. Um, for me, I always think they do more for the relationship than I do because they give me the knowledge. 
Yeah. And what I do is I just give back a way of expressing it to the public, okay? Uh, um, and, but I can't do that without visiting their labs, without spending time with them, sometimes see, and going to the sites like mm -hmm. a, a glacier where they work and understanding what mass balance really means. So it, it's a relationship where we're helping each other. And I think you're right, today there are so many artists, hundreds, probably thousands of artists who are working on this issue. Why? Well, because as Bill McKibben said, it's kind of important. And artists, I do think, reflect their times, don't they? And um, this is our time and, and we're reflecting big time and, you know, and we want to do more than blah, blah, blah. Yeah, and, and I just would like to add, you know, I think that one of the things that art has to offer, that science does, it, is the art world itself has a kind of openness um, it, it, it isn't about, it, it allows you to cross boundaries, yes. you know, in a way that often different scientific fields, you know, are much more siloed. And I can just think of a, a I mean, this is, it's a conversation I've had with a lot of artists over the years, and just two examples. Um, among the pioneering um, environmental artists are a pair of artists named um, <clears throat> uh, Helen and Newton Harrison, who kind of really, uh, pioneered this way of working with scientists, um, uh, uh, you know, city planners, um, specialists in many different fields, creating these, you know, creating these maps, basically, of, of ways, a lot of their work has to do with um, watersheds and, and the ways in which um, you can, th these problems that have been ar arising for decades in watersheds could be remediated. And what's interesting, and, and the question that often came up in terms of their work, so they would, they would come up with these plans, they would, these maps, and, you know, they, they had sort of these sort of poetic, um, text that would accompany them. And people would say, well, why are you doing this in an art museum? And, you know, they would say, because that's the place where we can do this, right. where we can cross these borders. And then, and, and, and you can bring these voices together because there's a kind of, you know, th there is this openness. Another example, um, you know, speaking to Mel Chin, who also did one of the kind of earliest and, you know, a very seminal and important uh, project, the, the revival field, which was a, an experiment in which um, he, he worked with a scientist to figure out how to use uh, metal, metal accumulating plants to leach pollutants out of the soil heavy metals out of the soil. And he, he initially approached the scientist because you know they, were, they had this shared interest and the scientist had been trying for years to get some kind of interest from the scientific bodies. And Mel said, well, we'll do it through art. Mm -hmm. And again, I mean, it, it was a place where the, they could come together and they could do something that was unorthodox and unexpected. So that's, I think, another thing that art allows. It, it, it allows that kind of border crossing. Absolutely, and you know, the other thing that art does is it's in the museums, but you know, think of Mel's work, who's a MacArthur Fellow, thank God he's been recognized for all the work he's done. Think of Olafar Eliasson, um, another example of, of how art, you know, it's not just things on the wall. I mean, and he engaged, you know, the, the whole community with these huge icebergs. And another um, art group that comes to mind, which I use in all my PowerPoints now, is Sun and Sea, the opera, the opera that won the prize at the 2019 Biennale and just came to New York. Did you see it? I didn't have a chance. I saw it in Philadelphia. <laughs> I didn't get to Venice, but it was so moving. If you read the libretto and, and you listen, it was a three hour production, although you kept you know, moving out, you had like an hour and other people come in, but an opera. So this is to speak to the idea that the arts in plural, filmmaking, um, drama, everything, you know, happenings. And then there's also um, the whole public practice, mm -hmm. you know, which is another way um, that artists have really done it. Think of um, the well, I think of Mary High Mattingly. Watermark is one. And Mary Mattingly and, and Mary lots Mattingly. of other right, artists right. that, yeah. Yeah. Uh, a slightly different subject, although I think uh, you have related them. Uh, the uh, global COVID-19 pandemic. How has it affected you as an artist? And how, have you, how has your painting changed during the uh, COVID uh, crisis? And why have you turned to mapping the spread of the virus while it has been shifting and changing around us? 
Well, um, mapping is sort of something I've always been involved with. Uh, it's the aerial view. And um, I always give Jim Terrell credit because, you know, way back in the 70s when I flew with him, it was the first time I looked down on the landscape. I said, well, this is cool. This is what I, this is what I wanna do because, you know, it is a 20th, 21st century of looking at the landscape. So that's how it started. And then maps are about charting the landscape. So it's another reference and I love looking at maps and maps give you a lot of information. So in your museum, Jack, we have the um, world map series, which is basically a 56 foot long series of paintings. One thing sort of led to another. There were four or five that had five that had to do with glaciers and then I went on to reefs. Um, so in, in the main show, in the main hallway, when you first walk in, you have two maps, one where the, the series started, I found a map of all the glaciers in the world. That was really a cool thing, so I had to make a painting about it. And then I found another one of all the reefs in the world. So that happened in 2019. And then we had COVID. Uh, well, there were a lot of maps. We all kept looking at them, you know, how to change the curve and all that. But I also saw this world map, and the irony about the world map, it was just like the maps that you see in the back of the brochures when you're in you know, an airline and you pick up that book and they show you the routes. Well, that's basically the COVID map. And I didn't realize it until my husband walked in and said, you know, that's, the, that's, the, that's what that is. And I said, you're right, but it was the same thing because that's how COVID spread. So I have to do a COVID map. I think it's really great that, the, that it's part of the exhibition. And, and it, you know, it, because it's affecting all of us everywhere and all of our we were talking about it, all of our exhibitions everything is sort of turned upside down sure. and it and it but it gave you the time to be able to do that work and have that be part of this because it's so it's so much part of the big bigger picture well so, and it's the same and the, thing isn't and it and that you've jumped in with this c kind of continuation of a series and a way of looking at the world yeah um, but it's, it's the sense. same thing we were talking about alexander von humboldt yeah. earlier um, you know, who knew about this way back then. You know, the web of the world, we are all in this together, as trite as that phrase is, it's about climate change and it's about a pandemic. It's the mm -hmm. same issue. And if we can see the world that way, you know. And I, I think that, yeah, the maps are a language that makes us understand the unity of all things. And that's really the point here of, you know, I think all the artists who are working on climate change right now are really talking about that. You know, that it's not, it's, this is not things that are happening in isolation, but to really understand it, you know, that's the conceptual tool that we have is the map. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So Mary Garrett and Norma Browdy are two you know, very important feminist art historians, scholars, and um, they brought me your show. And mm -hmm. so what does your show have to do with feminism? That's the question. Well, haven't you read Mary's essay, Jack? Yeah, <laughs> I was supposed I, to but, read but it. But maybe not everyone in the well, audience has. This is where my notes come in, because um, I'm asked that a lot. And I'm not a historian. I'm not a writer like you are, Eleanor. <clears throat> but I am a feminist. And um, I think to be a feminist is to be an environmentalist. I mean, they're inseparable. Thank you. <laughs> and. Um, What's really cool about Mary and Norma, Jack knows this, I met them 50 years ago in the feminist art movement, and they were dear friends uh, over the years. You know, we'd share college art association meetings together, Norma's show, a whole, you know, a suite of things, and they knew what I was doing. Uh, in 2011, I got this award, I forget what it was called, I, a Lifetime, I, some kind of an achievement award, um, for the WCACAA, and Mary gave me the award. I mean, she, you know, spoke. And I got her speech, and what's really cool about it, because I have a little quote from it, she was talking about that then, and 10 years, just 10 years later, she's kind of developed that whole idea, you know, crystallized it brilliantly, as, as she always does. So I'm gonna, do, if you could bear with me, this, I just found this, and I thought it was really good um, to talk about it. And this is Mary's concept, but. I like it. Uh, and her chapter, by the way, in the, um, in the catalog is Nature, Art, Gender, page 40, in case it's a long, it's a 19,000 word essay. But on page 40, that chapter begins. So when she's doing this thing in 2011, she shows two images, Gulfos, which was a, a painting I did, 
and a Frederick Church painting, Niagara, from 1857. And she says, Berko is sometimes compared to 19th century American landscape painters, <clears throat> such as Frederick Church and Thomas Moran, who also painted monumental images of volcanoes and waterfalls. Here above is Berko's Gofoss II of 2002, and below it, Church's Niagara, 1857. Two paintings, each about seven feet long. The artists share an admiration for nature's marvels, yet with a difference marked by gender. Church worked within the masculinist dialectic that positioned nature as culture's opposite, a binary that subtly influenced artists, especially men, to walk a line between celebrating nature's wild energy and glorifying man's effort to control it. And then she goes to another image of Church with a detail of a tree, and she says, Church hero heroizes, heroizes? heroicizes elements within the landscape, the rainbow and the tree branch, almost but not quite powerless against the mighty falls. The little branch is a stand-in for man struggling against the force of the elements. Burko socialized as female, the sex that historically has been identified with nature goes with the force itself. She avoids casting nature as culture's opponent claiming its power instead as her own, subverting the masculinist tradition in which nature is other. Burko paints swelling mountains and dynamic waterfalls, not as other, but as self, heroic metaphors for her personal aspirations and for those of feminism as well. That's all I'm gonna say about it. <laughs> Isn't that cool? I, I guess I should read it. But... <laughs> I mean, I would, and I would add, when we talk about kind of environmentalism and feminism, and I think they are indeed, I and mean, I've thought about this a lot, they're very closely linked, but we're, this is not to say that, that it is only women who have done this. Absolutely. You know, and you mentioned von Humboldt, you know, I mean, and, and we can look at, at the ranks of, of um, you know, eco, Oh, ecological sure. yeah. artists. So to me, kind of the feminism of the whole thing, you know, it has to do with a, a, a looking at the world holistically. Yes. And rather than, as you're saying, this sort of dominant, you know, there's this, this polarity between nature and culture. This idea that, you know, humans are outside of nature, right. they are affecting nature. There was just actually, a, I read just the other day, a very interesting, um, uh, editorial in The Guardian, um, which was written by James Lovelock, who is um, 102 years old. That was amazing to me. I didn't know he was still alive. I know, I didn't either. But he, he came up, he, he in, back in the 70s actually, came up with this, um, what, what has been a, a kind of very interesting and, and um, very influential theory about God, it, it, he, the, the nature of the, of the earth, as he calls it, as a self-regulating system. And he gave it the name Gaiaism. And of course, that refers back to the notion that goes, you know, back to prehistory of the earth as a kind of, of, of living thing. But he uses that as a kind of metaphor to talk about the way in which um, you, you, the, the world and the environment are interacting with each other. And, and one of the things that he talked about in this editorial that, you know, kind of really struck me, um, you know, he said, well, the, the Darwin, you know, kind of the more da uh, dominant Darwinian notion um, is that humans adapt to, the, to their environment. But what we're really seeing now is that the environment is adapting to humans and often in ways that are, may in fact spell the end of humans. The environment may be saying, okay, you know, this is a bad force and we are going to adapt it in such a way. He mentions COVID as a possibility, certainly all the wildfires, oh, you know, really? all the, the um, very extreme weather events as a way in which the climate, the environment is, is adapting back to us. Now, to me, this idea, you know, you know, and it's interesting that he gave it the name Gaiaism because, of course, that has a very feminist totally, quality. Yeah. Um, but that it, it's, it's, looking, it's looking holistically, and I think that that's the key thing, and that's what makes your work feminist and as well as environmental, and, and I, why I think you're right, that feminism is by nature environmental. And I just would add that I think that that, that also comes back to the 
first question of the artists that are engaging in the environment and are engaging in ecological art are seeing that we're of nature. Yes. We're not, it, it's not the separation. And I think that that also comes back to like how the work then helps remind us as a viewer or as a participant of that point of view. It's also bringing us back to indigenous cultures. Mm -hmm. Yes. And we know what uh, our patriarchy did to them. Okay, think about it. I mean, they had all the answers. They understood the totality of nature. Many, many cultures. A question for the panel in general. What are the goals of work that deals with climate change? What kinds of calls to action can be initiated through exhibitions and programs? Uh, what does the institution or presenter bring to the table and what does the artist bring? What are our roles? What does it mean for work like this to be effective? Mm. That's have a, a symposium. That's a there you go. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I, I mean, yeah, I think that this this whole event that you know, you, you know, it's not just an exhibition. This is it's it's about a whole kind of outreach. Yes. So you know, in terms of the question of effectiveness, I think that that's one of the things that this art needs to be presented on you know, sort of many different fronts, which is something that's possible in an institution like in this. In a university, yes. And, and my pattern or my edict as I've grown older and wiser is that I don't need another exhibition just to have an exhibition. So if I'm gonna do an exhibition, as Jack knows, um, th th there's, a, there's a requirement and the requirement is programming, not necessarily something as wonderful thank you, uh, Dean and Provost of, of a symposium, but a panel or speakers or something that brings the whole university in. That's another thing. When I go to different schools, like, you know, I was at Colgate pre-COVID right before, and um, there was a show and they wanted me to talk to the students, the art students, and I wrote back, I said, I'm not talking to just art students. If you can round up your geology, your sociology, your humanities students, I would love to come and talk. Okay, because that's the way we share information and spread the word to people who don't know things. Look, Jack, you told me there was someone in the show that thought I killed the coral. <laughs> <laughs> oh, how yeah. terrible. I, I, wait, I think, Jennifer, it'd be interesting to hear what you have to say about this as a curator. Yeah, so I've been a curator at Wave Hill, which is a garden and cultural center, right? So a garden doesn't have to exhibit art. I mean, a garden is about presenting plants, right, and growing plants and so on. And the range of exhibitions that we did touched on like zillions of different topics. But it was incredibly important that the environment was one of them because that is where a person from the city, even though the environment is growing all around, you know, ecology is everywhere in every little sidewalk crack and, and all around us. Mm -hmm somehow we don't think it exists until we go to like the natural world which of course isn't really natural because it's a garden and it's right. totally cultivated but still it's a platform and it's a place where where people are already thinking about nature so when you can do an exhibition that is ecologically oriented it, it, it it's it's hitting them in a moment when they may be receptive in a way that might be different if they saw it somewhere else and also we did, like one of the shows we did, um, Ecological Consciousness Artists as Instigator, was all about projects that took place in New York and most of them were something that was going on right now. And it was really important for people to understand that these are the artists around us who are doing these projects. These, some of these projects are things that you can go see in Flushing Meadow Park or you can go see in um, Newtown Creek or, or wherever. And I think that, I think that in, the, in a positive way, you could do shows like this all around the country mm -hmm. now because there are many artists that are really keenly observing what they're doing. And I think that is something that, that it's great to do in an art museum, but I think it's actually really good to do in another kind of a setting too, where people aren't coming necessarily to see art, but the art is there that is talking to, to you know, engaging the topic. I was just a on a way. Zoom thing, speaking of that, um, Echo Art Space did a Zoom thing yeah. with, with um, Extraction, this oh, program. Oh yes, I went to that too, that did, was really so did interesting. That woman yeah. said she had a show in, in a shopping mall. Yeah. It's a great idea. 
And yeah. I, you know, another thing that occurred to me is all these shopping malls are closing down. That's a yeah. lot of space for yeah. art museums and, you know, yeah. exhibitions. <laughs> well, and Eco Art Space did an exhibition with billboards, and I think I think there's a lot of I think people that are engaging with with art around ecology are also really looking for, you know, it's great to do things in museums, but mm -hmm. it's really important and it's our obligation to be able to be pr presenting mm -hmm. um, m much more broadly and thinking much more broadly Absolutely. about it. So I, I, I think this is a wonderful question. Uh, I think the, our conversation here is, is answering it, but how do we, we resist the seductions of apocalyptic thinking when we approach the realities of climate change. And you seem so positive, <laughs> despite everything you know. Well, I am a realist. I mean, you know, we're already there, okay? It's not an existential threat, it's here. I'm aware of it, I've learned enough and studied enough and spoken to enough scientists, but I'm, I'm, I'm a human being who's hopeful because if you're not hopeful, nothing's gonna get done. Right, you, you have to try to keep going forward. You have to meet like-minded people and work towards making things happen. That's what, look at Bill McKibben, look what he's done. I mean, he did stop that pipeline, okay? I mean, that was public involvement, public participation, mm -hmm. outreach, all that stuff. So, um, I, we can't go back, okay? We all know that. I, actually, I wish they would figure that out up at COP26. We're not gonna have less floods. We're not gonna have less fires, mm -hmm. but we could have more. So there's still time to mitigate as the scientists are now talking about. So that, that's why I'm, I mean, I have to be hopeful. That's, and I have to keep painting and I have to paint. I can't, paint. I, I'm, I'm not for the apocalypse. I, I don't wanna illustrate that. It, I don't think it gets you anywhere. You know, Robert Smithson talked about the dangers of succumbing to ecological despair. I mean, back in the That's 70s, the he said that. You know, and, and that is, it's a temptation sure. in a way. Um, and, and part of that has to do, again, with this notion of a, of a separation of hum, humankind from nature. You know, because then if you see yourself as this outsider mm -hmm. to the whole thing, and you see the whole thing sliding down, yeah, you, you don't have a sense of agency. And, you know, I think that, again, it, the, the key is to see it as, as a whole, yeah. you know, and so then within the whole, yes, it's true, we, we're not going back, but we adapt and, and, and that nature adapts to us and it's this constant sort of process. And so we have to be aware of that rather than thinking that we're coming to some sort of end point where, you know, it's, it's going to be done and then the angels will come down from heaven and, you know, if people will wrap up and that's the end yeah. of it. <laughs> Another popular theme in art. Yes, indeed. <laughs> well, I wonder if this is a good time to try to open up uh, the questions to the audience. Uh, we have two sources. One is the microphone over there and, and over there. And then there are uh, people uh, signing in online and leaving questions. Uh, do we have any uh, questions yet? Um, very good. Uh, is, would Maybe anybody we like need to, to remind our listeners yes. that if they have a question, they should put it in, in the chat, right? Right. Uh, before we go to the audience then, climate change has to be addressed both on the individual level and in terms of the need for political, economic, industrial change on a super grand scale. How can creative activities, including art, writing, music, and dance, provide imagery to advance our understanding on both these fronts? Well, what do we do? We quick, do, this what, what do, we do? Well, let's just quick, okay, let's just quick do this, and then yeah, please, yeah. stay there. Don't, don't, <laughs> don't go away. Oh, hey. okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah. But I would just say, no, it, I mean, this is, again, working on the macro and the micro, you know, and, and that there are, it's a many pronged front, basically, and we have to be aware of individual, you know, our individual responsibility, but I think it's also very important to see it as a larger systemic problem. And I think it's also, it, there, you know, to add to that, the, the micro can also be like, what, what is the climate we live, the place we live, right. something that's based around where we are and what what's being affected right and also the 
political issues, which are so huge, and and how we can exercise our our you know voice to be able to be active. Yeah, I think the political is extremely important, and I think I think it really rests in people like Greta. I I, I am just so impressed with the youth activism. It's just amazing, and you know we all are soldiers of you know movements and marches and all that stuff. But I, but I think the fervor and the energy that's coming out of our youth today, you know, high school kids, college kids, um, it, it's it, it it comes from the bottom and 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 you know it, it gets something done, not enough, but but things are happening and it comes it is a groundswell and. Yeah. And, it, and it helps you to not succumb to ecological despair. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> it gives you hope. And there's, there's a question over there. Yes, do we have a question we coming do. in? Oh, hi. Uh, could we turn the mic on? No. Uh, maybe, can you try to do the switch there? We can give her one of ours. <laughs> It's always that magic. <laughs> <laughs> um, please Take it right into it. Maybe we can do a session and talk about the better. Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe, can you take it? Yeah, maybe, yeah. There you go. Oh, that's really good. Excellent. Very good. Um, thank you all for your time. Right into it. Session. Oh, my goodness. There we go. <laughs> you never know. I used to be in radio. Um, so, I appreciate um, this discussion. Um, and I have a question, Diane, for you in particular. Um, I have the privilege of working with a bunch of scientists every day. I work for NOAA, the National oh, Oceanic wonderful. and Atmospheric Administration. I use their images. <laughs> yeah, I know you do. And I'm just curious, like clearly the scientists have had an impact on you. And I'm wondering, have you had an impact on the scientists, especially in that ecological despair mode? Like, have you heard feedback from them? What do people who are in it every day saying to you about what you do? Well, I said earlier, I, I think we, we have a really great relationship. Um, I, I have never met a scientist who doesn't love an artist, and I mean it. And, um, you know, I didn't know scientists when I first got into this field, and I started with ice and glaciers, uh, and I started finding all these repeat photographs on, online, the Ice and Snow Center, NASA, um, NOAA later when I got into the oceans. Uh, and I didn't know if I could even use their images. You know, is that allowed? Is it in the public domain? So I started writing and asking, can I use your image? And uh, a man named Bruce Molnia, who actually is the head of the Explorers Club, where I have to speak tomorrow night, called me up and he taught me. He literally explained to me what a repeat image was, the idea that glaciologists have been photographing things ever since they had cameras. They go to the same spot, they photograph it every year, and that's what a repeat image is. And that was the first body of work I did in my big um, politics of snow show uh, in, in 2010. And I, I developed a relationship with him, and that led to my being invited to the AGU, the American Geophysical Union. I had no idea what that even meant. You know, I knew the CAA, right? So the CAA has about, at tops, 5,000 members. I go to this AGU meeting in San Francisco and there are 25,000 earth scientists. It's unbelievable. And they all look like, most of them were guys, Birkenstocks, beards, the whole nine yards. But um, they had a panel on how artists communicate climate change. And they, that's why I was invited. And scientists are eager to have us, all kinds of artists, talk about what they do, because they know we can do a good job. Um, think of Chasing Ice or Chasing Corals, two you know, popular films. They were done with filmmakers. Um, and uh, James Balog, as a matter of fact, is having a show down the street at the National Academy of Sciences. And, and, and we met at one of those um, meetings. So this is all to say that there is um, a reciprocal relationship uh, between us, as I said earlier. So I think they like us. And, you know, they, I'm, I'm an in-star affiliate because I met some other scientists. One thing leads to another. 
I met a guy named Jack Kohler, who I adore because he, I walked on my first glacier, thanks to him and the Norwegian Polar Institute. So um, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, but it, it, positive, it's all positive. We have another question from Ira from the audience at home. I want to ask about beauty and clarity. How do we represent the space around us and be aware of making art attractive to the eye and convey the urgency of the climate situation? About no, I think you should talk without your mask on. Sure, yeah. is that better? Yes. Okay. Um, Ira from the audience asks, I want to ask about beauty and clarity. How do we re represent the space around us, be aware of making art attractive to the eye, and convey the urgency of the climate situation? Aesthetics of climate change, or of, of this kind of work. Right. Well, the importance of the aesthetics, I think, is... Is that what they're asking? Yeah. yeah. I, I think it's terribly important. Um, that's, you know, I believe in beauty, okay? I'm not, I'm, I'm not, you know, someone who likes ugliness. So, but I see beauty as a way of um, seducing. I'm, I'm, I'm a seductive artist. I want to bring the viewer in by talking about the beauty of, of, of nature, of, of the landscape, of, of you know, the world that we still have. And then I also want to remind them that we're going to lose it if they don't do something, if we don't wake up. Okay, so it's sort of a combination, but aesthetics. And I think the essays in the catalog actually, um, Mary's in particular addresses that. Um, and I'm thinking about an artist named Courtney Madison who yes. works with Coral. I recommended Coral, her for one of these. And, some, yeah. and she, um, Coral reefs, she scuba dives, she's, she makes these amazing ceramic amazing pieces stuff. that show the live and dead, um, you know, bleached coral. And, you know, it's so awesome. I mean, awesome. And, and, it, and it's just so compelling the way that it hits you because it's not only, it's beautiful, but it's, it's, yeah. it's, it, yeah, it's, it's in the, it's there, it, you, so, it's, it's visceral. Yeah, so, and I guess, oh, I, I guess that's in Mary's essay, she talks about the sublime. And but that was Norma, actually. Norma, Norma sorry, Norma is, Norma is, is about the sublime. Yes. And, and how we're not, it's not the sublime when you're talking about being in it, you know? We're, and, and that's where I think that where you can take the beauty and but put yourself in that situation that is, that is the climate change mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. is really compelling. I think you were the next yep. uh, in-person interlocutor. And maybe take your mask off. Hi, uh, my name is mask off? Yeah. yeah. Just you, just Hi, off. my name is Aishwarya, and I'm an LLM student at the AU WCL, and I'm specializing in international environmental law. So I had a question regarding that. So do you see art and law correlating anywhere soon or in the future? Because as per my knowledge, art gives you and creates an emotional impact on people. Whereas law is the enforcing agency, so do you see anything of in course. the future? Of course. Thank you. I, I, I mean, environmental law is terribly important. I mean, we can only take policy to a certain level, and then you guys got to get the laws done. <laughs> we need the EPA. I mean, we uh, law is, is, is it, it's it's what you've been saying. It's all of one piece, and. Yes, I, I see the connection. I'm thinking of, um, there's an artist named Aviva Romani who has, yes, uh, I Aviva's speak for the trees one. piece, yeah, she has which is, which is all, she's using the legal system to, of land ownership, right, yeah, to yeah. draw attention to the plight of trees um, in upstate New York. And, and the, the, I think there's probably ex good examples of other artists that are using the legal system um, and need to collaborate with lawyers in order to do that because they, they it's bringing the, expertise together. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Larry, you're next. Diane, I could show it's fat. Take off, the Take off your mask. Take I off can. my mask. They'll throw me out next. <laughs> um, Diane, the show is great. It says what it is you want it to say, and I think it does a lot more for a lot of people who look at it. it makes them ask questions. So it's you talking, and it's also them thinking inside themselves. I just want to give one little example of something. We can't all be environmental artists or even artists at all. We can appreciate art. But there is something that happened in the New York State. I'm from New York State, upstate New York. Um, during the fracking fight, it was called the Lobbying Day, the Anti-Fracking Lobbying Day, in which artists 
went with the Sierra Club, Food and Water Watch, 350, et cetera. Unmasked, maybe 2,500 people showed up every year until they banned fracking in New York. Yeah. They didn't just ban it. They drove out the salesmen who were buying up farms from, at that time, devastated dairy farmers who had been prohibited from being dairy farmers because of another type of pollution, which was in the reservoirs. And one of the things that some of the artists did that I thought was just great, I'm a performance artist, so it has really, I had nothing to leave. They made little things to put on the, the state senators and the state assemblymen's desks. Perfect. So that they had a reminder after we left the lobbying day. Do, do I need to describe what a lobbying day is? I mean, uh, no. Okay, you all know. Um, and it was it was kind of a, a, a terrific thing. You're in thing. Washington. You know. What? You're in Washington. Is that where I am? We, we know. We know. Where's Trump? I, you know. Let's, uh, uh, so we was, okay. So we're in Washington. Um, so you know. So but that was a terrific. I, I think Christy Rupp came up with one, and a couple of other people. And it was like a tchotchke, you know, a little thing. But it reminded the le legislative body and the assistants, we mean business, and we're not going away. You go back three or four years in a row, and they sort of start to take it seriously. Yes. Now the great threat is that my group has 860 people. The Artist Voter Project. We can turn an election. Yeah. It is not that complicated. 800 people turns an election. Not a national election, but a local election. And that's where the fight is at the local level. It is not a global fight because at the local level, you have to have the will in order to make it a, a global fight. And you know, my question is, can we get more artists to go out there and join with you know, not politicians, but political activists and go to the seats of power, because that's where the fight changes in the seats of power. Thank you. No, I agree. We march, but we yeah. could do more, I'm right. sure. Yeah, I mean, I think that artists, we, we all need to be more educated in the workings of the corridors of power right. and, and what we can do. Policy, yeah, yeah. Well, my first vision about this symposium was to really incorporate every school at AU. I wanted the School of Policy to be involved. I wanted the law school to be involved, remember? And your wish was our command. You know, we're, <laughs> yes. we have the year of climate change That's involves right. all the departments across I, the university over see the it. next year. That's right. what has to happen. Right. Yeah. And we've talked about like setting up voting registration tables, you know, yeah. and, yeah. and different ways around. to specifically yeah. get it going. A yeah. unity. Question over there. Take off your mask so we can hear the you. The signs say uh, keep your mask on while you're using the microphone. You can take it off to talk. Yeah. Okay. I won't pay attention to the sign. It's telling me what to do. Um, thank you all for headlining uh, this important and impactful symposium. And it's wonderful to see you again, Diane. And it's been a pleasure to host you in the studio art program, Eleanor. Um, in 1982, Benjamin Chavez described the ways that communities of color and economically disadvantaged populations are more often affected by climate crisis as environmental racism. I would appreciate hearing if or how your respective practices as artists and as curators address environmental racism, or if you would offer insights in how artists who talk about environmental concerns could address this. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, you know, part of my notes was also to give a plug to a book. And the book is by Catherine Wilkinson, who co-edited a book, uh, climate anthology, called All We Can Save. And she had an op-ed in the um, New York Times over the summer, and I, I researched it because I thought it was so great. And again, she says the same thing about if you're going to be a feminist on a hot planet, you have to be a climate feminist. But she talks a lot about just what you're ra raising, Zoe. It's about the idea that if you think about this issue, first of all, it affects women more than it affects men, and it affects women of color more, and it affects women in indigenous societies more. And um, I thought I had a quote just from that, if I can find it. Let me paint you a little. 
climate ch patriarchy, patriarchy. Maybe I didn't have that quote, but absolutely. Now I address it when I do my public outreach. If you know, I didn't do it today, but the question came up, and that's important. Um, but lots of times when I'm talking to audiences, um, students especially, I, I talk about that issue, and that that issue is about the fact that it's everything, right? It, it, and pollution, think about it. Where is the pollution? Where are the communities that get hit by pollution more than other communities? I mean, it's, it's right there in mapping. You can map it. Yeah. Well, I mean, the whole idea of the Green New Deal was yeah. also to see that all of these things are connected. Exactly, yeah. Um, I'm thinking about a project in New York with the, um, the Point, which is a community development corporation in Hunts Point, and they have a whole like year about resiliency. And they had um, had, you know, in in many ways of, of approaching resiliency, and it's also in a flood prone area. But they had artist residencies. They got funding to have artist residencies working with doing community engagement. And I think I'm I'm seeing more and more projects like this that are, you know, to get back to what Larry was saying about working locally, are are engaging artists of color, work like working really side by side with those organizations that are 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 working in the community and i think in the trenches and, and in the trenches and and side by side with a group that's actually dealing with the issue right so you bring the artists and the and the local based organizations are, are working mm -hmm. together and those organizations are seeing like the scientists are seeing it's good to work with artists and artists are seeing like they just artists can't just do this by yourself you have to be working with the grassroots organization. Well, it's social practice. I mean, social... Eve Mosher is such a great example mm -hmm. of that and did that so early on yeah. with her, you know, high watermark. She, mm -hmm. walked, she worked in communities. Mm -hmm. They didn't know what she was doing. Yeah. She engaged them. Yeah, and I'm, I'm thinking of Mel Chin also sure. and his, yeah, you know, kind of recent work, which, you know, it had this whole sort of, you know, beginning with, with Flint, um, you know, Michigan and, and, and the lead crisis and then the water bottles that people were having to use and, because they couldn't drink the water and they were piling up and then turning these into a, a fabric, which then, and then having a designer create them as, uh, you know, rainwear, and then coming back to Flint and having the people, of the, these women, uh, you know, in, in Flint, Michigan, um, create these, giving them employment. I mean, it was it was a brilliant, just a brilliant, a brilliant, brilliant. project. He's brilliant. He's yeah. brilliant. Yeah, I mean, but it, and it's about engaging all of these different you know, forms of community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think there's a question there. Um, okay, Jack, can you hear me? Yes, good enough. Um, how, with the current administration, oh. it's brought a light to environmental issues. The current conference that we just have seen mm -hmm. has brought it to a higher level than we've seen in years. My question to the panel, Jack, would be how do you create a sense of sustainability in this, regardless of the administration awareness, and how do you bring it to an elementary level? Because the people here have a concern. There's an awareness that's more almost a generational thing. How do we bring it to a level of awareness that they can carry this into the future? Well, I think nature is raising the awareness every time there's a flood. Every time you know there's a fire, I, I think it's it's happening almost unintentionally by any of us. And then in terms of the elementary level, I think school kids today know a hell of a lot more than their grandparents do. And that's why Bill McKibben actually has left 350.org to start another organization. I'm blocking, remember what it's called? Mm -hmm. um, but it's an organization that is literally geared to his age group and older. So, yeah, and I mean, it also it goes back to what we were saying about local, you yeah. know, I mean, you know, so the administration, you know, they come and go, some are more friendly than others, but, you know, this, this, it, working on the local level where those issues are urgent to the community, I think is, is, that's an important key. And I would say that I'm seeing artists, you know, just out of grad school that are really, or just out of college that are really engaged with environmental issues in a way that maybe wasn't the case 20 years ago. Oh, sure. So I, I see that as a really positive light mm -hmm. that I see that, if it's that, it, that 
It isn't just us old fogies no, that are. It isn't. It are. Isn't <laughs> yeah, yeah. And 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 Harvey, I would just add one more thing. It's, it has a lot to do with people who help to sponsor events like this. You yeah. know that to make this possible. Yes. Because uh, this is also where we can get get to work from. Yeah. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Uh, my name is John Kamoga. I'm a graduate student at SPA, and I come from Uganda. So the question, my question is about uh, environmental justice. And as she rightly put it, uh, most of the underprivileged uh, communities uh, you know, are mostly affected by the devastating effects of climate change. And coming from Uganda, I know exactly what that means because the whole discussion of climate change has not really gained traction because of the many challenges that people down there are dealing with. You know, uh, people are, you know, fighting to make ends meet, to feed their families and it's a bit far-fetched to talk about tree planting uh, for a country like Ethiopia that is going through war right now. And I'm asking myself, how can artists in those uh, communities uh, be assisted to, you know, uh, raise their voices to also contribute to this uh, discussion? And globally, again, you see that, you know, the representation at a global level is still not that, uh, mm. you know, good. So, yeah, that's my question. Thank you. So, yeah, I guess the, the question how in, I mean, there, there are many parts of the world where, you know, the, I mean, in, in terms of environmental justice, things are very dire and they are in a way being hurt more, and yet there's so many other problems that they have as well. I don't know if this is kind of what you were getting at, but, and, and so how do you help the artists in those places to become involved? And that's a, that's yeah. A, that's, a, that's a really big question. But you know, you raised another question there that made me think about another connection about politics and policy <clears throat> and world events. A lot of the strife in the world comes from climate disasters. Think of Syria. Think of the drought. I mean, that, that's what started all that. All the people having to come into the city because they no longer could farm. And why did that happen? Because that country didn't really pay attention to their environment. And that, that happens a lot, you know? So it's... I think the question, though, of how... I mean, we're, we're sitting here in a very privileged, very privileged situation. To talking about this, but I think the question that you raise about how to, um, to, you know, what are resources for artists in other places who would like to be able to do this kind of work, and how, you know, how how do artists even in in any in any place find out about well, doing this? Well, I think this? it's I, easier now than before yeah. because of Zoom and really the internet has its faults for sure but in this last year and a half two years of covid there's been so much integration of international interest mm -hmm. and the ability to to do that mm -hmm. you know so it's going towards that but that's a really good question it's kind of a curator question mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, curators have i mean if you think about the art world in the last 15 years it's gone global Right? Mm -hmm. you, no longer is it all Western art at the mm -hmm. Metropolitan mm -hmm. Museum of Art or any institution. I mean, look at the shows that you have, Jack. So it, it's happening, but I don't know. I don't know how to speed it up. I don't have that kind of power. <laughs> how about a virtual question? Yeah, I think this question is for Diane from Jesse from the audience. Have you done any works of art on the distributional equity issues that climate change is revealing? And how do you treat the inequities of cause and effect of climate change? Is the mic not? Sure. 
Have you done any works on the distributional equity of climate change and the cause and effect, uh, and how do you treat those inequities of climate change? It's, a, it's kind of a follow-up to what we were just yeah, talking about. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't think I have in my actual work something to think about, although my current project and interest is the Amazon uh, and the inequities that are going on there in terms of indigenous people's land. Um, it goes all the way back to actually, Andrew Refkin wrote a book about this in 1990-something uh, about the rubber plantation. So. Uh, in that sense, I'm, I'm very interested now in extraction and the mining that's going on in, in the Amazon. So maybe I'm addressing it that way, but not in a direct way. And if this person could email me and give me some ideas, I'd be glad to listen. Hi, Dan. Uh, Valerie Asher here, Henry and Jim's friend. Hi, Valerie. How are um, you? not an artist, um, but somebody who is very interested in how artists engage their audience. And I'm, I'm, a, I'm a person in my 60s, and I'm, I'm really intrigued by the way Instagram and TikTok are ways that artists engage in ways that are outside of museums, outside of galleries, and have a chance to engage audiences that are not necessarily the traditional consumers of art. I know you have an Instagram because I follow you, Dan. But I'm wondering if you've thought about ways to use your Instagram to engage those other audiences um, in law, in politics, to bring your art to them and to get your message out. And are, are there ways that um, we can look at how the younger generation is using these bite-sized but extremely accessible forms of Art and, and the Instagram itself can be a form of art. So I just like to hear your thoughts on that. Um, I don't know, is Molly still here? I can't see if Molly is here, but Molly is a new friend of mine who's an AU graduate who's um, into uh, criminal, criminal justice issues, juvenile justice in particular. And she works with a good friend of mine, uh, Richard Ross, who came to see the show, who's out in Santa Barbara. And she's been helping me with my, not Instagram as much as of like Twitter. I can't do Twitter, but Molly can. And um, yes, the answer is the more you can go out of your comfort zone, which is the art world, into others, things spread. I mean, it's amazing. And even Instagram is amazing. I, I've gotten lots of interesting um, DMs uh, from my Instagram account, much more so than Facebook. I don't, I don't, the only reason I keep doing Facebook is I have collectors who <laughs> use Facebook. Um, but I, you're right. I, I think you're, you're absolutely right. It, it, it's a very good way. And I think arts are using that. Don't you think so? Yeah. Right? And, and museums are using it as well. Apt I mean, oh, AU's been through. amazing with this and whole, there's, there's, there's really, been so much posting going on. There's really Thank no you, going Jessica. back. Right, you know, right. You're, you're, no, there's been a, yeah, and it has to continue. But hitting those other fields, I think, is crucial. You're absolutely right. So would you like to uh, say any final words, anybody? Uh, <laughs> last chance to address this I would say thank you audience. for having us and hosting this. Well, and hopefully you. you'll do more climate-related exhibitions. And maybe this will be a biannual symposium. Who knows? Oh, that would be great. With, with. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Jack. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank what you. a great panel. Thank you so much. It's so great to have you here. Thank you, Diane. Thank you. And we can go, we can go into the museum now, yes, right, Jack? I think so. <laughs> All right. And to go into the museum to see some of the artwork that we've been talking about. And let me also say a number of questions arose today regarding climate justice, and I would encourage you to consider attending the lunchtime keynote speaker uh, tomorrow, Dr. Mustafa Santiago Ali, who has been active for decades in this area. He is currently the Vice President of Environmental Justice for the National Wildlife Federation. He opened the Environmental Justice Office um, in the uh, EPA and, the, uh, and, and has uh, also been uh, uh, the head of the Hip Hop Caucus, and in other ways we'll be addressing that topic uh, squarely. 
So I know that there was a lot of interest in that. That'll be tomorrow uh, at 12.30 uh, as on the schedule. And I beg your pardon? It, it will be virtual, yeah. It, it yeah. is virtual and in person. Right. If you'd like to attend in person, I think there's also still right. room uh, for, for that. And you could stop by the table on your way out to speak to one of the organizers if you'd like to attend in person. But it will also be streamed as is the entire symposium uh, through, uh, the, uh, through a single link. So thank you all again for your interest, your participation, for taking the time to join us and for your excellent questions. And uh, thanks again to the panel. Uh, excuse me, yes. Jackson gave me permission to interrupt you. Yes, please. Sorry, Dean. Um, but there's a, second, there's a second keynote that I'd like, there's a second keynote that I'd like to mention, and that's Debbie Lockwood, who will be the afternoon keynote, I think it, is it on there? But I think it's 3.30. 3.30. And she just came out with a book published by Simon & Schuster, called A Thousand and One Voices on Climate Change. And I met Debbie many years ago. And uh, she's traveled all over the world gathering stories about climate change. So she'll be here and signing books uh, tomorrow afternoon. Yes, much of that trip was by bicycle. Yeah. Yes. This is all recorded. Yes. Well, thanks again for coming. Thank and you. please join us across the hall. Thank you.